My name is Randy Howell, and you're listening to the Faith and Fishing Podcast. Welcome to the Faith and Fishing Podcast, where every episode I'll bring you an interview with a member of the fishing community, and they'll be sharing their faith stories and fishing memories with you. I'm your host, Cam Steele. Hey, y'all. Welcome back to the Faith and Fishing Podcast. We've got a returning guest this episode coming back on to talk about grouper fishing and surrendering to God. But first, you know we've got some housekeeping things to go over. First, since all of you have been so amazing and have been listening to the podcast, Faith and Fishing hit 4,000 downloads at the end of February. To say thank you, um, thank you, thank you, thank you for the entire month of March. Everything in the merch store is 20% off when you use the promo code FNF4K. So follow the All Things Faith and Fishing link in the show notes and click on the merch store. Order your t-shirts. Remember, we have the guest quote t-shirts and logo shirts. Grab your stickers or your hoodies. Use that promo code um, FNF4K and get 20% off. You don't have a whole lot of time left if you are listening to this now, though, so make sure you go get that ordered. The other new thing to talk about is the Patreon page. You can support the podcast by going over to patreon.com slash faithandfishing and becoming a patron. You can also find that in the show notes in the All Things Faith and Fishing link. Patrons get to see videos of the guest interviews before the episode airs, so you not only get early access to the biggest part of the show, you get to see the conversation unedited. Uh, Episodes like this, where the guest goes into a lot of depth, including a lot of visual stuff about the gear he's using, you don't want to miss that video. Um, But yeah, so I got to fish in my first in-person tournament since the last episode, and well, the weather did not cooperate. First, because of the forecast, the tournament director thought about moving it to Sunday. Then he decided to keep it on Saturday. Then the forecast got worse. Um, then the forecast got worse, so he said we could fish Saturday or Sunday. Then the forecast got worse again, and he decided to make it a two-day event that did not count towards AOI points. Well, Saturday was the only day that I could fish it because of other obligations on Sunday, um, so I went Saturday. There weren't many of us that braved the elements on Saturday, and I think I might have been the only one in a paddle kayak. I've never been one to envy the guys with pedals or motors, but I definitely would have loved to have had that kind of help that day. (laughs) Even a rudder would have made a huge difference. So let me paint the picture for you. We get up. I'm already planning on going a little late to avoid the thunderstorms. I start the prayer call that I do before every tournament for our trail. It's pouring and the wind is howling and I know people are already traveling to the ramp, maybe even setting up and I am praying um, and I'm praying, listening to this pair of wrens sing their hearts out in the middle of the storm, which just made for an awesome picture of what it's like to um, what it's like praising God because he's God despite our circumstances. Anyways. I go and I get to the launch and I'm setting up in the rain and the wind that is insane. At at this point, it's somewhere around 55, uh, 56 degrees. And I I make a few mishaps um, that we'll go over in a minute and learn from my mistake. And then I go and get on the water. Now, it's still raining. The wind is blowing somewhere in the 20 to 25 mile hour uh, range and gust a lot higher than that. Um, From here, the temperature started dropping. By the time we finished the day, the temperature was in the mid to upper 30s with a wind chill down in the 20s. Um, I ended up paddling around five miles in this craziness and getting blown around it uh, at a really good clip every time I stopped paddling. The wind almost blew the wind almost blew my paddle out of my hands a few times. Um, it got super cold and the skies even dropped some snow and sleet on us. I ended up leaving the lake a little early. I could not find the fish, which means that this was the first time I ever skunked on Sharon Harris, and this is the first time that I skunked in my Lucky Savior hat. Um, I got so cold, thank God for the coffee, because I would not have lasted as long as I did without having something warm to drink. Um, and for Saturday, anglers in the club were throwing words around like brutal, nope, miserable that one was my word and i think paul roberts summed it up best as the guy who was in the lead after the first day unpleasant 
The next morning ended up being rough too on the guys who went out to fish and they were dealing with ice on their guides with air temps around 20 and wind chill of around 13 at launch time. Um, overall, it was a good learning experience. I really did enjoy myself even if the conditions were not at all favorable. Um, but yeah, so that was a lot of me talking and we've got some more before I get our guest in here. So let's go ahead, take a quick break and dive into learn from my mistake. Atollis, based out of Charleston, South Carolina, is an eyewear accessory and gear company focused on enhancing your time on the water. Their floating sunglass retainers are the most technically advanced around. Over five years of engineering, testing, and exhaustive feedback from paddlers, anglers, and watermen have resulted in a patented design and a class of its own. They're incredibly light and comfortable, built for durability, sport a sleek, minimal design, float virtually all brands and models of sunglasses, and they're back for life. So if you break them, Atollis will replace them. No questions asked. Whether you're fishing, kayaking, or boating, Atollis will save your shades from the dream. Head on over to A-T-O-L-L-A-S dot C-O to check out their gear and use promo code FAITHINFISH15. That's FAITH, the letter N, FISH, the number one, five, at checkout to save 15% on your order. If you're looking for a photographer in and around the Raleigh, North Carolina area, the one I recommend you go with is Summer DeSalvo. Whether you're looking for family portraits, senior pictures, or business headshots, Summer's got your back. She's done family portraits for us and even a kayak photo shoot for me, and I have to say she's really fun to work with, goes above and beyond to get her shot, has a really fast turnaround time, and most importantly, takes amazing pictures. Check out her portfolio and pricing in the All Things Faith and Vision link in the show notes or go straight there at summerdesalvophotography.mypixiesite.com. That's summerdisalvophotography.mypixiesite.com. So this time on Learn From My Mistake, we are jumping right back into that tournament. So this time we are going to be talking about setting up and connecting electronics. Now something you need to know about me is electrical stuff is my specialty. Well, usually. So this one hurts a little bit. I mean a lot. So for this story, the main thing you need to remember about electricity is that it always follows the path of least resistance. In this instance, that is what saved me. So I was setting up my fish finder in the rain and I let the rain get to me a little bit and I got in a rush. Um, I did inspect all my gear before I packed up, but apparently as I was pulling stuff out of my car, the cable for the connection for my fish finder got twisted a little bit and I did not notice. Um, so I plugged it into the battery and then whenever I positioned the battery, uh, the wires where they twisted, uh, bare wires touched, it short circuited and blew the connectors that I was using. Now, I should probably explain how I had it set up. So, I had one little cable connected to the battery with a quick connector on it, and another quick connector attached to the power cord for the fish finder. This usually worked, and it saved myself about half a second or so when I was setting up. The wires that crossed were just on the side of the fish finder, um, and since electricity always follows the path of least resistance, it didn't even make it uh, make it up to the fuse on the fish finder. So the fuse and the fish finder itself, they're all in they're all still in good shape, which is good. But it did blow my connectors. It was a bright spark, loud pop, even a little smoke. But I didn't have any of those kinds of tools with me or extra connectors with me. Um, so I went into this tournament with such bad conditions, with no way to see what was going on under the water. Did it cost me? Maybe. But hey, I got to learn from my mistake and I skipped the quick connector on the next go round. And that means that now I connect direct to the battery. Um, so yeah, take your time when you're setting up, y'all. It's all about the details. All right, now let's jump into the product spotlight right after another quick break. Get Outdoors Pedal and Paddle in Greensboro, North Carolina offers a wide range of products and services designed to help protect the environment and enhance the time people spend enjoying the outdoors. 
with an expansive year-round inventory of kayaks, sups, bikes, kayak fishing accessories, paddling clothing, biking accessories, and more, Get Outdoors has established itself as one of the top paddle sports and biking shops in the southeast. They also offer a wide range of kayak safety and technique courses to get you comfortable in your new boat. They'll even get it rigged up for you. Stop by the shop in Greensboro, North Carolina, or check them out at shopgetoutdoors.com. Whether you're a Ned Rig vet or a finesse fishing noob like me, Jade's Jigs is your source for high quality finesse jigs that raise the bar by being lead free. Using a tin bismuth alloy not only makes Jade's Jigs eco-friendly, it also makes the jig lighter so you get the same profile with less weight for the fish to feel. Check out jadesjigs.com, that's J-A-D-E-S-J-I-G-S.com to see their full lineup of jigs, styles, and colors. And since you're a Faith and Fishing listener, you can save 10% on your order by using promo code FNF10 at checkout. We're already running long, so this is going to be a quick product spotlight. Let's talk about the Contigo Byron Stainless Steel Travel Mug with Snap Seal Lid and Grip. Holy cow, what a name. This is the thermos that I took with me for the tournament and the coffee stayed warm the whole tournament despite the wind, rain, snow, sleet, and cold temperatures. And it kept me in good enough spirits to keep going. Now, I do have to say that now they are only selling the Byron 2.0, and I don't know what the differences there are other than the aesthetics. It looks like to me they might have made it more cup holder friendly, maybe. Um, it's got more of a, of a rounded base, but, um, but there's not a whole lot to say about this thing. It holds 16 ounces of coffee. The lid doesn't leak. It's got a silicone grip so it doesn't burn your hand, and it flat out keeps your coffee hot. I poured the coffee at 7 that morning, and at 3 that afternoon, it wasn't piping hot, but it was a lot warmer than lukewarm, and that was more than enough for how cold it was. You can get yours at Walmart, and I will leave links in the show notes. Um, so, yeah, now let's keep moving and go straight into What You're Reading. What You're Reading, presented by Quail Ridge Books, Raleigh, North Carolina's trusted community bookstore. It's time for the What You're Reading segment. As always, What You're Reading is presented by Quail Ridge Books. Quail Ridge Books is an indie bookstore offering free shipping, and we have some of the best customer service that you'll find anywhere, and I can vouch for that because I might be the one helping you. This time on What You're Reading, we're going to be talking about a book that I absolutely love, and it is How to Think Like a Fish by Jeremy Wade and published by Decopa Press. You may recognize the name Jeremy Wade as the host of River Monsters. The storytelling brilliance that made Jeremy Wade's TV show River Monsters such a hit is on full display in How to Think Like a Fish. Fishermen aren't typically known for their honesty, though that stigma is changing, at least within the fishing community. Um, but this book's um, but this book is a beautifully honest look at the failures, trial and error, and natural instinct that have made Wade a successful angler all over the world. From carp fishing close to his home in the UK to catching giant catfish in India and South America, to catching vicious goliath tigerfish in the Congo, the reader joins Wade on his adventures and gets behind-the-scenes stories from his time filming River Monsters. With a name like How to Think Like a Fish, you expect a book full of fishing tips, and this book does not disappoint. Years of learning through studying the fish he pursues and through trial and error gave Jeremy Wade so much knowledge to share. I wasn't surprised that this book made me a better fisherman. But what I was surprised by was that this book changed the way I looked at the world and forced me to examine my own habits and consumption. Wade discusses the state of the world's rivers, how we, we being the human race, have caused the disappearance of the apex predators of these river systems, and how if we do not make changes there will be no big fish left for our children and grandchildren to experience fishing for. The bottom line is that I cannot recommend this book enough. I thoroughly enjoyed every word. If you would like to order a copy for yourself, be sure to click the link in the All Things Faith and Fishing link in the show notes and click on Quail Ridge Books, or go straight to it at quailridgebooks.com slash faithandfishing. Now let's jump into this guest interview. Save Your Outdoors gives me confidence that no matter what happens, what I take on the water is coming back home with me. 
with retrieval devices for fishing rods, bow fishing bows, action cams, and even one that can be attached to your other gear, they've got your whole arsenal covered. When one of these devices goes in the drink, it releases a float attached to your gear by 60 feet of line so you can get it back, and the pressure sensitive filter means that you don't have to worry about rain or dips in the water while landing a fish. At SaveYourOutdoors.com, that's S-A-V-U-R Outdoors.com, you can use promo code FNFP15 to save 15% and try them for yourself. Okay, um, take two. Um, we are um, doing things a little bit different now. Um, so if you are um, watching on Patreon, you can see me, you can see our guest um, before the episode comes out. You get to see this, uh, this interview um, and, and know what's going to, to, to happen there. But at the same time, you also um, will, um, will have to listen to the episode to, to listen to the other segments. But um, this episode, we have a returning guest. Uh, we have Mr. Dan Flowen author of Fisherman's Apprentice, um, this phenomenal book right here. Um, he is coming back to, uh, to talk about grouper and uh, to talk about uh, some other, other awesome topics. Um, we do have a guest co-host tonight, which is um, that black blob over there is my, uh, my beagle Rosie. She was scratching at the door to come in, so she is going to hang out with us tonight as long as she doesn't get too rowdy. Um, and so if you hear any weird groaning or sighing noises coming from over that way, that's what that is. Um, but yeah, so, uh, let's go ahead and get, uh, get Dan in here. Dan is, um, like I said, he's an author. He is, um, a business owner. He's a cancer survivor. He is a, uh, husband, a father and a child of God. And he is, um, he, he reached out to to come back on and we are uh, we're going to be having an awesome conversation so let's get Dan added in here Dan man welcome to the show hey hey cam thanks for having me back absolutely and I guess welcome back is the correct correct thing to say I, I, yeah. I messed it up again um, and I say again because we have already done this uh, we only made it in about um, about 10 minutes or so so it wasn't wasn't too awfully bad before I realized that we were not recording. Um, it's not like uh, um, that episode of Bass and Brews where he he got I think he got like twenty five minutes in before he realized. So, um, <laughs> so Paul, if you were listening, you were not the only one to make the mistake. Um, but yeah, so uh, I see the little the live um, the red live up there in the corner now. So we are good to go. Uh, so Dan, uh, kind of. Um, give us a rundown. Anybody who did not listen to uh, the episode you were on previously, um, if they did not, I definitely recommend they go back and listen. It was an awesome, um, awesome time. Otherwise, I would not have had you had you back on. But, um, but yeah. So, uh, kind of give us a rundown of who Dan Flowen is. Yeah. Well, uh, we uh, uh, I'm the founder of this company called PM2 been uh in business for about 20 years with me and my wife julie and um got a daughter 23 year old laurel she lives up in uh, philadelphia uh, i'm an avid fisherman and um uh, as you said a child of god i i i'm, I'm a strong believer in uh, uh just being obedient and and uh taking steps in faith and i just gosh i just have so many stories to tell um of of instances where where god you know showed me uh something to do or tell me told me told me a direction to take and i take it and and he provides or he he uh removes a barrier or something like that so um i'm i'm a i i try my best every day to uh, well try to be a a fisher of men, but it, we're all fishers of men in training, and that's that's me. So, absolutely. So, um, kind of give us a, an idea of what PM two is. So you've uh, you mentioned that, um, and so kind of give us give us the rundown of of what PM two does um, and and how y'all go about doing that. Yeah, so PM two is uh, acronym stands for Professional Materials Management. So we do materials management and really uh, we specialize in spare parts really so we we have teams that go out 
um, all over the country and some international. Go out to mainly, mainly manufacturing uh, plants and help them set up their spare parts inventory. It's, it's an often overlooked area. Um, you know, they may be really good at building jet airplanes, but they might not have a good handle on their spare part inventory. So we design the room, set up the room, organize the inventory, build the inventory database, count it, label it, and then we do consulting around that too. So we've got teams going uh, all over the country doing that. And uh, it's been uh, it's been fantastic. God has really blessed it. And, and this year's uh, no different. We're having a, just a fantastic year. That is awesome. And uh, I, uh, we were talking about it earlier. That's something I could definitely uh, nerd out to that uh, kind of, it, it's not something you typically think about right away. Whenever you, um, whenever you think of, um, you know, something that like running, running something like a hospital or manufacturing mm-hmm. all the little pieces and all the big pieces of stuff that you have to store. What do you do with it? Um, exactly. All of that stuff. And um, yeah, like, I remember listening to my mom, uh, my, my granddad, whenever he retired from the air force, had a, a hydraulic shop and once a year they had to do inventory. And I remember oh, yeah. hearing all the stories about having her, you know, count each individual nut, each individual bolt, uh, all mm-hmm. of that stuff in there. So I can definitely, um, I remember, you know, going through his shop and everything had a spot, everything, um, everything fits somewhere all the really tiny pieces all the way up to the big pieces. I, I definitely mm-hmm. can, can, uh, can see, see, see what it is that you do. I'd, I'd love to see some of the CAD drawings just to see like what something like a hospital, what something like a big manufacturing plan or something like that would, would need um, to, to look at. But that, as that's, that's really awesome. Um, but something that um, is in the book um, that you you talk about is giving that business to God. Um, and I, I, that's something that that is is foreign to a lot of people. That is something that uh, um, is intimidating to a lot of people. It's scary. Um, what does that look like? Um, what did it look like for you? Um, I want I want to know kind of some of the the, the dirty details on that kind of. I uh, get an idea of, of what that looked like for, for you, for PM2, what that kind of looked like for, um, uh, in your experience, what, what brought that about? Um, because, you know, it's, it's not just businesses that people, people dedicate to God, you know, and people dedicate, right. you know, they, they have like baby dedications where we dedicate our children to God. We, uh, we dedicate our lives to God. We, we, um, like, told told god from the beginning this podcast is yours um you know relationships all that good stuff what uh kind of kind of give it from from your standpoint what that looked like and um and i'll i'll stop rambling now and let you take over (laughs) well cam i wish i could tell you that i decided to give the company back to god uh because out of my wisdom or some wise epiphany that i had but it, it wasn't it wasn't that way it's not a, it, not at all how it happened um you know it 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 really came at a point where we had launched the company and we're about three years in and we were bleeding profusely really having no idea where else to turn you know and when I need some time to think, I go fishing. So I happened to be fishing and I was casting a plug along a a seawall and uh, just by myself. And I heard for the first time uh, a voice just felt like it was emanating from the depths of my soul. It wasn't an audible voice, you know, but I could, I knew somebody was talking to me. And he said, Dan, the business is mine. It always has been. And if you give it back to me, I will take care of you. And I, that, that really took me a minute to, first of all, decide who that was. Um, was that just me making that up? What the, you know, or was that, it? was that him talking to me? And if that was him talking to me, well, 
one thing I knew for sure, he couldn't possibly do worse with the business than, than we had done in these last three years. So, you know, I didn't feel like we had a lot to lose, you know, I wish I could tell you it was this huge leap of faith, but, um, it was kind of it was kind of out of out of out of nowhere else to turn. We said, God, if 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 you want this business to survive, it's yours. It's yours, and do with it what you will. And then from there, I um, at the time I was a 50-50 partner with my, my co-founder Eric, and so then that 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 then required me to go to to Eric and say, well, um, I just gave my half of the company to. To, to God, um, what do you think? <laughs> you know, do you feel like following suit? And uh, Eric being Eric um, came, he came around to the idea a lot faster than I did. And so we um, pretty quickly decided that was the right thing to do. And then what that looked like after that, uh, from that point was really, really redefining our mission statement um uh telling our employees and contractors that they now work for a company owned by god and what does that really mean that you know everything that we do now um has to honor god we've got to try to honor god with everything we do because if i were god and i owned this company i would want this company to represent me well um so you know god made us in his image so and and he wrote a whole book about his character um and so even though we're not god we can he created us like him so we can kind of get a feel for you know what he might expect you know he's, he's he has desires for us just as we have desires for our children so what that looked like is just just a it was a, a, a been a many multi year journey really what what to, of how to how to really uh, deliver excellence in a way that that God would be honored by and being a Christian business it it's uh, you know as Christians we try to be very gracious sometimes so gracious to the detriment of uh, maybe we maybe we let an employee um, be a sub performer for too long because we we want to be gracious um, and there's a there's a delicate balance there because God expects excellence and he wants he wants quality and yes we want to be we want to be patient and gracious with our people and with our with our customers, but he also expects high quality. So there's there's when we turned it over to God, it, it it seemed like you know there were there were there were now standards that we needed to live up to that didn't exist before, and um, and we 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 became aware of how short we fell on some of those pretty quickly. And so that's why I say it was, it's been a multi-year, it's an ongoing uh, process of trying to be the company that, that we think God wants it to be. Absolutely. And as um, you know, for me, whenever I've done the, you know, this is yours, God, it's been, you know, this podcast, it's a religious podcast, bands that I've been in that were religious bands, um, as something like see something like PM two that is you know it's in the secular world. Um, what where do you start? Um, so like if somebody is listening that they are um, they feel you know they feel led to to give their business to God, but they don't know where to start. Like where, where do you start? I know you you mentioned uh, you know mission statement um, stuff like that, but what's kind of the what's kind of the first step and. Um, and what does that look like? Yeah, well, uh, you know, it, it truly is. The mission statement is the very first thing is to, to uh, what, how are you going to focus the energies of your company? And so um, what does that look like for you as a company? For us, it's it's honoring God through through inventory services. And then 
really building on that then what what are the core values then if that's our mission to honor god through inventory um what are the core values that we want to demonstrate um and we call them um we call them our rules of engagement we've got like six of them um and the first one is act at all times as though god is watching because he is um and so we began to you begin to kind of rewrite and rethink um what's your objective as a business and it's not just to make money you know it's uh, our objective as a business, the reason this business exists is to glorify God first, but take care of the people within the business and take care of um, and minister to um, the people within and outside our customers, our clients, our partners, try to be, uh, try to be uh, ministers to them. So if that's the point of what we're doing, then everything else has to drive toward that. Um, so, that, uh, that again is a it's a multi-step multi-year process that we're still still in the process of and how, what are some of the ways that, that you're ministering um, while you're while you're doing you know inventory management uh, for example you know we, we launched a, a a foundation it's called the PM2 foundation and so we take a percentage of all of our profits and that goes into uh, the foundation fund and so we're looking as we go out to clients and um, particularly we're looking internally because our number one our, our number one mission and calling is to is to be ministers to the people that are in our organization um and so we're looking for opportunities to um, really just uh, care for them and minister them. We have a, we we had a, a a health concern come up um, just recently, and we're looking for opportunities to maybe bridge a gap. You know, the this person might not be able to work for weeks, if not months, and so now, um, and they're a 1099 contractor. So there's money now in the foundation that allows us to, if we choose, and I think we're going to, um, compensate him in a way that uh, he's not he's not hurt financially for having uh, this financial this uh, this physical uh, uh, disease. So. You know, we're just looking for ways, like I said, first and foremost, to minister to our own people. But then when we go out on the on our project sites and talk to the clients, sometimes we'll become aware of a a cause or a mission that they are interested in. And then we're looking for ways to say, hey, you know, we we're a Christian organization. We have this foundation We're we're very much uh ministry of minded is there a way that we can come alongside you and do something with you either either physically with our presence or uh, financially support it uh, or both um, so um, we uh, we've got a, a wonderful uh, partner company here who happens to be a, a member of c12 a, a Christian CEO roundtable we're a member of and his company has coordinated every month he coordinates uh, uh he has a coordinator that that coordinates ministry opportunities to go out and um, do various things um, go to go to the soup kitchen or go build a house and habitat habitat for humanity or whatever it is so it's, it's, they've really simplified the way uh, a, a way to 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 participate and and do ministry together so that's been a fantastic blessing for us that another christian company has come alongside all of the other uh, uh, christian organization here in the tampa uh tampa bay area and has gone ahead and said here's here's a here's a calendar of events that and and come join us and so that's been fantastic to to uh to participate in some of those things as well. Absolutely. That's awesome. I, I 
Thank you for that. Um, that was that was something that I wanted to to touch on uh, for this episode. But you you reached out. One of the reasons that you wanted to to come back on was you felt like whenever we talked last time, we didn't get to talk enough fishing, and you wanted That's to right. talk fishing. <laughs> but let's, uh, uh, something that is near and dear to your heart that I know absolutely nothing about um, is grouper fishing. Um, so I'm going to let you kind of, um, kind of get started. I'm going to ask questions where I am, uh, where I need more, um, more clarification or something, because like I said, this is something that is, that I have never, never been, uh, uh, been a part of or anything I would love to one day. Um, I'm hoping to get to do it with you one day. That would be awesome. Absolutely. Um, because yeah. I will say I have not fished for grouper, but I have tasted grouper, and um, that is that is some good eating fish. And I am uh, I, I'm looking forward to to learning more. So, so I'll let you uh, I'll let you kind of get that conversation started, and and I'll jump in. Yeah, there is nothing better than a fresh grouper sandwich that you just caught that day. I, I just I just tell you, it's amazing. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm pulling out my Navionics app right now um, to, to give you a feel for what we do. But I've been doing this for uh, probably f- really only five or six years now. And I have to credit, uh, um, oh, gosh, I forget now. Um, I'm going to forget his name now. It'll come to me. Um, oh, shoot, I can't say his name now. It'll come to me. Anyway, there's a there's a legend here uh, in the Tampa Bay area that uh, that I've Vance Tice. Wow, I can't believe that it took so long to come. Vance Tice is a local legend here that uh, has been doing this for oh probably 25 or 30 years, and I've had the pleasure of being on his boat. He's come out on. Uh, our boat and really taught us how to do this. So 90% of what I'm going to show you and talk to you about, it's not, it not, it's not my uh, original work. This is Vance Tice and his wisdom, but um, I've been very successful uh, with it. So uh, I'll just, I'll try to try to pass along the, um, the tips that I that I've learned from Vance. So what we do in Tampa Bay, um, we troll the ship channels. So if you if you look at Tampa Bay, I'll uh, I'll zoom in here. Let's see if you can see that uh, right there. Um, the, all those little green marks. Those are my. Those are that's where we've caught grouper. And if you can see the the white, it's kind of fuzzy, kind of kind of fuzzy. But there's we're ch- we're trolling along the edge of the ship channel, so the average the average depth um, in Tampa Bay is about 25 feet, and then the ship channel goes to oh 45 50 feet usually, and so we will troll on the upper edge of that channel so we're trolling in 25 to maybe 30 32 feet so we're just trolling that break and uh so you're watching your sonar of course and um and avionics is a great great app uh um if you anybody that uses that it's they've got great um you know relief detail and so you can pretty well follow the edge of that channel and the, the, the grouper will, will sit uh, along those edges. And, you know, they, they did a lot of blasting to cut the shipping channel. So there's big limestone rock down there where they, where they, um, they have nice cover down there. And um, so that's, that's generally what we're doing. The, uh, the best time, um, we, we use the salooner tables quite a bit and the tide. So you want to troll in a uh, kind of a slow moving tide. So like, uh, let's see, look at uh, the hill tide here. So if you can see that, 
Uh, well, that's not what I want to show you. There it is. Uh, can you see that? That, that? that camera didn't want to pick it up. Well, I'm looking at a, t at, at, at a it's a tide chart. But you want to you want to be trolling either at the beginning or the end of a a tide movement. And the reason for that is the the grouper when the tide is really ripping, they're going to be down underneath the like behind the rock, much like a trout in a stream. You know, they're trying to get cover and not have to fight the current. So they're going to they're going to lay down at the bottom behind a rock. They're probably not going to go chase something that you're going to pull by them if the tide is really ripping. So you're looking for uh, some movement, but not, you know, a lot of movement. When that water tends to when it slows, then as you're going over those the grouper, you'll see on your sonar, you'll you'll be going over the rocks and you'll see the fish actually sitting on top of the rocks when the when the tide is right when the tide is ripping the fish will be way down behind the rock so you want to be trolling when the when they're up above on the top of the rock when they're kind of in the feeding mode the other thing to think about when uh again i you know maybe compare it to maybe trout fishing you know in a stream a trout he swims with the nose his nose facing into the current and same thing uh, grouper does you know, when the current is uh, he, he's he's swimming into the current so he's facing upstream and so what you want to do is you want to be trolling downstream and bring the bait to his face rather than dragging a bait over his back okay so the water clarity in tampa um when the water's really cold when the algae is low you might have 15 feet of clarity but in the summertime you get a lot of algae you might have down there maybe five feet of clarity and so you want to give as much opportunity as possible for to to bring that bait right in front of his nose and he has you know plenty of time to think about what you know what he's going to do and, and strike that bait awesome so um I will say if, if any of this stuff that you want to, to share, if it's something you can pull up on your computer, you can uh, down at the bottom, there's a share um, button that will share your screen so that we can see, see your screen. So if that's cool. something you can look up on your computer, you can show us that way. Okay. Um, cool. I will, I will say, um, so you're trolling. Are you trolling with like, um, like chunks of bait or are you ch uh, trolling with lures? Uh, what are you trolling with? Yeah, we used downriggers, and I, I brought, I brought. This is the downrigger I use. It's it's actually an old pen, Fathom Master. You can't buy them anymore. Um, but there's a company right here in Tampa that actually bought all of their inventory and uh, you know their patents, I guess. Um, and now they're called. I think it's called Trollmaster uh, Seahorse. And so they look for all the world like this. It's the same chassis and so forth. The one thing that I really like about this older uh, downrigger is that you'll see this rod holder is bolted on, rigid, it is solid. And that's really important because when a big grouper hits, I you know this, this group, grouper might be 30 inches and 20 pounds and they can pull like a freight train and so you've got this big rod here that i'm trolling with this is a kind of a big grouper rod and this is my it's a pen squall two-speed reel um but when he hits that a big fish um a, a lesser rod holder will i think will just break it, you you'll lose your rod and everything else so but what i do is i i use downriggers and then the, the the downriggers themselves are they're mounted really midships right 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 by the right by my my helm station so i've got one on each side of me so that when a fish does hit um you're right there you're not you're not trying to run to the back of the boat to to you know to grab the rod 
Um, the ball we use is a 10 pound ball. And then there's a lanyard here. And this is something I got from Vance Tice. Makes it really convenient. This is about a 300 pound monofilament, just a little line here. So when this when this ball's at the surface, and I want to uh, attach my line to the to the ball, you're actually attaching. There's a little clip right here. It's a little spring loaded little clip. The this clip goes to a a number thirty two rubber band like this, and then that line. You wrap around your your running line of your your rod. So when the when the fish strikes, if it's a good enough sized fish, he's going to break the rubber band, and then it's just you and the fish. So that's the idea. The beauty of the rubber band, though, is when and here's I'll show you the bait. This is this is the bait we're using. It's a four ounce jig, pretty good size hook there. If you can see that there it is and then the little grub tail here it's a six inch I use these gulp it's a scented it's you can see the the juice and it's just just a smelly stinky you know beautiful thing <laughs> but uh, I use the chartreuse or the white um, that's something Vance did not show me, but I really am a believer in the scented tails. And so this is what you're pulling through the water. And it looks, I think it looks for all the world like a squid to them when, when it's swimming through the water. And uh, when the bite is on, they just can't leave these alone. So, but the beauty of the rubber band is that you want to have that bait. You're going to need to be bouncing bottom with it once in a while. If you're not bouncing bottom, you're not, you're not deep enough. So um, the rubber band is going to give, and it'll be less likely to pop um, off off your line. So it'll 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 give as opposed to um, those of you have used these balls before. A lot of times you get these clips, and it's a pressure clip, and uh, they're they're not as good because they're you just be constantly resetting your bait and the rubber band really really helps to not have to reset and reset and reset your bait all the time. So the 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 other reason that I put the this the downriggers at midships, not in the back of the boat, is so that I can see the downrigger balls on my fish finder which is really important because then, then you can, you can see exactly where the balls are. You know, that the balls are probably, Oh, I'm pulling, I'm pulling this maybe 40 feet behind the downrigger ball going about three and a half, four miles an hour. And so this is probably maybe three or four feet, below the ball. So I know if my, if the downrigger balls are three or four feet off the bottom, this, this jig is just about bouncing off the bottom. And that's exactly where you want to be. So. Um, that's awesome. It's, it's yeah. really interesting to see how, even though the, um, even though the equipment is so very different, how a lot of a lot of the the stuff that uh, that we know from from bass fishing like carries over to to mm -hmm. simpler stuff. You know, like you were talking about, like if you're if you're used to fishing smallmouth bass in a river, it's the same same like exactly same way you were talking about with the the grouper facing the current being um, you know whenever it whenever it gets real strong current, they're in the current breaks. They're not. Um, they may, they may ambush something in the main current, but they're going right back. Um, exactly. and, and then, you know, bumping the bottom, that's, that's something that, you know, we're always talking about in bass fishing is, um, you know, you're, uh, I mean, obviously it depends on the time of year and everything, but, mm -hmm. um, you know, if you're, if you're, there are certain things that if you're not bumping the bottom, you're not doing it right. So that's right. That's right. Yeah. Awesome. 
And so, um, and you also mentioned the gulp, um, that, uh, have you found any, uh, any, any tricks, um, or, uh, any, any, uh, any special advice on how to get the scent off of your hands once you've been using it? <laughs> uh, not really. <laughs> I, I kind of, uh, I kind of smell bad all day when I'm fishing a uh, grouper. The other thing I want to show you that then this, this gets smelly too, because one thing that's really important with, with grouper fishing, the, uh, the gill rakers, inside their gill and the gill plate themselves are really really sharp and boy they will they will tear your hand to pieces so i wear these gloves and they're you know they're they're by uh uh this this is a fish monkey brand glove but you know i can still tie and all that but it, it protects my hand from the the gills primarily but these things get pretty uh, pretty ripe with the uh, with that uh, that gulp juice, so I, I have to wash these uh, pretty regularly. <laughs> <laughs> For sure, yeah. I I have a pair of fish monkey gloves that I, I use in the winter time that I really really like. They were actually on a product spotlight here recently, but uh, yeah. yeah, they they make some good some good gloves, but. Um, there's one guy that that swears by Windex. Says that Windex gets like. Uh, hmm gets gets the scent off but um i haven't i haven't tried it i i tried it once with with um i was i was bluegill fishing and had you know the bluegill scent all over my hands and and i I sprayed um windex on it and the thing about bluegills is they have really spiky fins and you can't you can't fish for bluegill without getting your hands all torn up Mm. and when you spray windex on that you will never do it again (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah i can imagine <laughs> um, that's what yeah so so you mentioned how fast you were going uh you so um something that's a little bit different for for grouper y'all have y'all have a season right that y'all are that y'all y'all yeah. fish what yeah. what is your season like july 1st through uh december 31st so um the temperature that they seem to like the most is about uh, 68 to oh, 78, uh, 75, 78. So in the dead of summer when it's really hot, I mean, we in, here in Tampa, you know, the bay in the dead of summer will be 90 degrees. And so that's generally not so good, although, you know, there are days that we that we do fantastic, you know, for whatever reason. But usually it's it's early in the the early summer or uh, late fall winter you know november december when the water has cooled and you're in that 70 72 degree range that's that's when we seem to do best Um, one thing though is when the water does cool as i mentioned before the water does clear and so we're using um on the on the rod is this 50 pound uh monofilament uh, on the on the reel with typically it's 80 pound fluorocarbon liter like when the, when the clarity is more like summer clarity but when the as the water cools and that water clears then we lighten our liter and we go to 60 pound uh, fluoro and that seems to Im- improve our bite a little bit so and then two uh, one other thing i wanted to show you this is another one of vance tice's secret weapons um, this is a hal. It's called a Halco Trembler. It's got a rattle in it. It just makes all kinds of noise. It's actually a Wahoo lure. But okay. um, if there are days that you, uh, you typically you'd want to, you'd start out with a, a jig like this on either side. Maybe one yellow, one uh, one chartreuse, one white, something like that. If you're just having a hard time getting a bite, sometimes, sometimes send this down and it'll just, just really get their attention, and that that will uh, uh, get a strike too. So, um, as 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 Vance has said for years, you know, kind of like a bass, you know, they're a, they're an aggressive kind of a territorial. You know, if you drag something through their living room, they're gonna attack it. And so you want to 
you know, just get something that gets their attention. Um, and uh, particularly if the water's maybe not that clear, something that makes a little noise um, can help. Absolutely. That that vibration is 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 really key. And a lot of times they mm-hmm. all fish have that lateral line that they just they pick up vibration from a long way away. So, yeah. Uh, I was just curious on the um, on the the season. Is that to like protect them during spawning time, or is that um, it, what's the what's the reason for that specific um, time that you can you can target them? Well, I would say spawning for sure, but uh, I think that you know in Florida we we they do a pretty good job of protecting the fishery here. I mean we're uh, you know we're such a we're such a uh, you know tourist centric economy here that we've got to make sure that we protect protect the fishery so i would say spawning would be the number one thing but uh you know in fact well speaking of speaking of uh, protecting they just opened up uh down here a a small uh, m- uh, uh limit i think up to oh, what was it 30 40 pounds you can actually keep a goliath grouper now uh with a tag well, and that's and they've been protected for years. So the good news is the Goliath grouper are coming back strong, and uh, we've caught quite a few of them in the last few years. Um, so they're uh, they felt like they could open them up now too. So that's awesome. Yeah, I'm definitely jealous. There, um, North Carolina is. Um, they had they have really dropped the ball whenever it comes to their saltwater fishery. Hmm. Uh, we. Um, I, I guess it was a couple years ago now that um, they were talking. Um, I never saw anything that, that came out of it, but uh, um, uh, North Carolina uh, was being sued for its mismanagement of of our fishery, of our saltwater fishery, yeah. especially. So um, they, um, between you know, just commercial fisher fishing. Um, uh, like commercial fishing license for um, for people who um, are not using it for commercial use and um, mm-hmm. and um, you know just trawling our estu- estuaries um, there's still a lot of that so we we're on the verge of not being able to fish for flounder for probably another hundred years or so um, oh, it's no, uh, it's, uh, it's it's rough but you are you are actually frozen. Um, I am yeah. going to let's see. I'm going to drop you out and then bring you back in. See if that helps. There you are. There we go. All right. Welcome back. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So, um, you gotta love technical difficulties. <laughs> yeah. All right. So before we we had our uh, had our technical difficulties. You mentioned something that anytime somebody from Florida mentions grouper, everybody wants to know, and that is about Goliath groupers. Mm-hmm. Uh, so let's let's talk Goliath. Um, so I know that you have you've tackled a few. Um, so I'll give you kind of a a, a chance to kind of brag about how big the, the Goliaths that you have gone after are. Um, but let I want to I want to talk about. The, the difference between between uh, trolling for it, it's, it's gag that you troll for right gag grouper yeah. gag okay. grouper yeah okay. once a blue moon we catch a red grouper but it's almost always gag, gag grouper okay so let's talk about the difference between gag grouper and goliath grouper okay so well the first most obvious difference is just sheer size so a large gag grouper would be maybe a 30 or 32 inch grouper and might weigh 15 20 pounds a large goliath grouper could go seven eight hundred pounds right so and be you know six seven feet long um I would guess, of course, we don't we don't bring them in the boat or weigh them or anything like that. But just based based on you know length and girth, probably the largest one we've caught was probably four or five hundred pounds. And um, two different ways we've we fish for them. Um, one is 
uh, literally with an anchor road um, from West Marine. We go out and get an anchor road and we uh, uh, tie about uh, oh, 30 feet of double strand 600 pound monofilament. Uh, so we double it and we crimp it, you know, like, you know, one of these crimps here um, with a just a huge hook. I don't know the size of the hook, but it's probably that probably got about a opening of about two, two inches or so big circle hook. And then um, we'll, uh, and then a pretty good size weight, say about a uh, eight or 10 ounce weight to just get it down. And so usually I'm fishing with a, a piece of Benita, which is a, you know, small tuna. It's bloody, you know, it's, you know, it's got a great scent. Um, I'll usually cut it in half and put a half of Benita down on that. Um, the key though there is to keep it off the bottom, just like a grouper. Uh, the first thing a grouper is going to do when he's hooked is go for the structures. You can go for the rocks, try to cut you off. So, uh, what you want to do with Goliath grouper is, um, I'll, I will first, before I put any bait on the hook, I will first gauge the depth to then let it go all the way to the bottom with the weight and just a bare hook. And then bring it up to where I think the right, uh, the right uh, depth is to, to make sure that that fish can't make the bottom when he, when he gets on. At that point, I'll cleat the anchor road around, you know, one of the midship cleats. And then I put a, it's a, uh, these, you've seen these big orange, uh, floats. It's a, it's an anchor marker ball. Um, that's my bobber. And so, <laughs> so I tie that, I just loop that to the anchor road and throw the whole thing over. So the, the anchor float is what's take it. What's what's actually holding the bait off the bottom. And at that point, you're just kind of waiting. Um, the thing about Goliath grouper is they, they are the top predator out there at, on the reef. So they're not afraid of anything. They, they're, they're an easy target, you know, which is why they were overfished so, so terribly, you know, for so many years. So it's, I'm glad to hear, uh, see that they're coming back. But you put a bait down there, and if they're in the neighborhood, you're probably going to get bit. So, but be sure that you have that anchor road on the cleat. Um, the first fish I caught, the very first one, I was out with Laurel and Julie, and I made the mistake of putting a bait on the hook and lowering it down before I had the other side of it cleated. And I got a hit and tried to grab the line with my uh, just bare hands and wound up breaking my ring finger um, right here at the knuckle um, because I was trying to hang on so, so strong and he, he, uh, and it broke my, broke my finger. <laughs> so, so they can, they pull like you cannot believe they just, they will pull your boat around. I remember another time I was uh, fishing and I had a, 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 a Goliath grouper rig down, you know, waiting. And, you know, usually you're doing other things too. You know, in Florida, you can have, you know, you're not limited to the number of lines you can have out. So I've got a grouper rig down and I've, I've got a couple of other things going on at the surface, maybe, a, you know, a surface line and maybe a, another little small bait, you know, on a bobber, let's say. And I'm standing on the end of the boat. And I noticed that the, there's water moving by the boat really quick. And I'm thinking to myself, wow, the, the current is really ripping right now. <laughs> no, we were being dragged by a Goliath grouper. And uh, he drug us for a, a good while. And then uh, um, I, should, I say that it was probably, probably only maybe 15, 20 seconds to be quite honest. Good thing about a Goliath grouper, they don't have a lot of stamina. Um, they fight really, really hard for the first 20 or 30 seconds. 
and then they then they kind of roll over. Uh, they they come fairly easy at that point, and and then it then you want to get them you want to get them to the surface and release them as quick as possible. Um, if you fight them for too long, when I first started doing this, I I was using lighter tackle. I was using actually this rod right here I showed you before. This rod I caught my first Goliath grouper on, and I fought him for too long and. By the time I was able to release him, I thought he was going to die. He was he was belly up, laying on his side for a, a while, and you know I'm, I'm trying to you know kind of revive him, and finally he kind of revived and swam back down to the bottom. So you want to you want to get him up as fast as you can, and get him get him get him uh, released as fast as you can. Absolutely, yeah, it's. It's interesting how they, um, how they're they're like that. The the bigger the fish, the the less stamina they have. But it mm-hmm. kind of makes sense too. You know, it's um, you know, you look at a at a at a two year old, their energy never runs out. That's right. You, you look at a you look at a at a three hundred pound thirty year old, and their energy <laughs> runs out pretty quick. <laughs> exactly. 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 Well, it's a lot of fun. You know, it's, uh, we get probably, uh, well, for every group, Goliath grouper we catch, we, we catch, uh, for, well, I'll say for every two or three Goliath grouper we catch, we catch a, a big nurse shark and they're always interesting too. And they have a lot of, uh, stamina, unlike a Goliath grouper grouper. So yeah, uh, they don't, they don't, they don't fight. They don't, they don't fight like hard. They just, slow and steady like they just yeah yeah, very, yeah. And they're, so, they're, they're just all you know they're gosh just all muscle and not a bone in their body it's all cartilage so they're super flexible and yeah yeah Absolutely. a lot of fun well we are we're getting pretty close to an hour um so i wanted to make sure that um we're going to do some different questions this time we always do a what's your favorite segment and since you've already answered our normal, uh, what's your favorite? I uh, I came up with some new ones. Um, I was putting them down in my, my phone earlier. So, um, so let's uh, let's jump into to what's your favorite. Uh, and mm-hmm. to start it off this time, we're going to say, what's your favorite character from the Bible? Oh, I would have your favorite oh. character. From the Bible? I would have to say David, um, you know, he's, I, 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 I certainly want to, wouldn't want to compare myself to, you know, him, except to say that he made some pretty serious mistakes and, and God still called him a man after his own heart. And, you know, he had the, even after the worst mistakes or after the most um, uh, trying times, he would always go back to God and, um, and God received him and honored him, you know, for that. So I, I, uh, I, I I really admire that about him. And I, 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 uh, I take great hope in that. um, Absolutely. That God, that God uh, forgives uh, even your worst mistakes. Absolutely. What about um, what about a favorite uh, favorite book of the Bible? I think Psalm. Yeah, um, and in particular Psalm ninety one um, came to me at a time. God God brought it to me at a time. Uh, that I really needed to, to hear um, the the praises of God and the protection of God. If you read now Psalm 91, he talks about, you know, uh, sheltering you with his wings and, um, you know, living under the shelter of the Most High and, um, and you know, no, no disease will come, come to your home if you, if you, uh, live under the shelter of the most high. And so if you know my story, uh, 
if you read the book, um, you'll, you'll know that there were some very, very dark times with stage four cancer and, and other things. Um, and those were times I really needed to hear uh, a good word from from the Lord. Absolutely. Do you have a favorite translation of the Bible? I'd say the the New Living Translation would be my favorite. Yeah, uh, just awesome. just seems like I don't know. It just seems like it's plain English, but it's not. Uh, but it still sounds familiar to me. For you know, you grow up growing up in Sunday school and church, you you, you know you kind of expect John three sixteen to sound like John three sixteen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so, sure. so so yeah, there's that familiarity. But I do like uh, that's my favorite. I think absolutely. I I have to agree with you on that one. That one's mine too. That one's the one I usually recommend. Um, unless you're you know going to be writing a paper. On, on on something um, that would be the only time I would I would suggest a different one, but most of the time I'm I'm picking New Living just because I I, I like that it's a conversational tone and yeah. like you said it's 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 familiar. Um, yeah, I, I I have to agree with you there. Um, what is your favorite time of day to fish? First thing in the morning, sunrise. I, I like to be out there when the sun's just coming up and oh, that's just, um, man, that's, that's God's creation right there. So <laughs> for sure. And, uh, your favorite lure color. Color. Oh, um, well, I guess I would put it in terms of what we were just talking about. And I would say chartreuse for for the trolling we were talking about anyway. And then my second, uh, depending on the lure, like if it's a hard body lure, uh, good old fashioned red and white in salt water. It's a redhead uh, with a white body uh, for like some of the some of the the diving, uh, like the Rapalas and things like that. The hard body, um, they do really well in salt water. I've always wondered why that color combination works so well in salt water. Yeah. Uh, and I, I have a theory on that actually, because if you, if you look what happens to baits when they are in the bait well too long, they bump their noses all day long and they get red. And I'm wondering if that has anything to do with the, you know, the, the, you know, the, 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 that the bait fish is in any way, you know, maybe the, the predator fish thinks that the fish is in any way injured or compromised and uh, maybe, you know, easier prey. That's my theory. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, that, that color works well in, in freshwater, too, a lot of times. It, uh, it's not like a go-to for a lot of people, but they, I, I definitely see some people throwing it, and it, and it definitely works. So I just I, – I've never – I've always wondered why that combination works so well. Yeah. Uh, I mean, stuff like stuff like chartreuse, you know, it, it, it's flashy. It gets attention. Mm -hmm. uh, but even though it doesn't look natural at all, um, like the ones that like the little gotcha plugs that are, that are like, uh, neon chartreuse and neon orange together. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. I, I mean, I, it, it gets your attention like in the ocean. A lot of things are visual predators. So right. bright color, but I've always wondered about the white and red. Um, yeah. But yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a definitely a good theory. I haven't heard, heard, a heard anything better for sure. So, <laughs> uh, so of all of these questions, this one is the only one I'm going to judge you for. If you, if you get a, if you put an answer out there, I'm not happy with <laughs> <laughs> What's your favorite pizza topping? My favorite pizza topping. Oh, okay. Now I first have to tell you that you're talking to a vegan, um, be, um, mostly unless it's a holiday. So, <laughs> um, pizza topping would probably well. Uh, okay, if I'm eating meat, I would say pepperoni. So if it's a holiday, it's cheese and pepperoni. Okay. A nice safe answer. 
what if it's a, <laughs> what if what if it's not a holiday? What are your vegan uh, vegan options? Well, oh, go to uh, there? veggie pizza is not my favorite. But when I when I do order veggie pizza, I will order. Um, let's see, I have them put peppers and onions and uh, pineapple and uh, and. And then depending on the pizzeria, some most pizzerias don't have uh, non-dairy cheese, but there are a few in Tampa that actually do non-dairy cheese. So if I can get non-dairy cheese, I'll do that with, uh, of course, tomato sauce. But, um, yeah, peppers, onions, tomatoes, um, and pineapple. So it's kind of a Hawaiian, I guess you could say, without the Canadian bacon. <laughs> I hear you. That's, that's awesome. Yeah, we've got a... Uh... I, I, a few of the people I work with are, are vegan. And whenever we do I like our pizza on inventory day, when we're counting all the books, we <laughs> have a few, a few vegan pizzas come in. So I haven't, yeah. I, I haven't, I haven't tried any of them because I, I, you know, I can't eat the other stuff. So I'm going to let the people who can't eat the stuff. Yeah. Eat. <laughs> exactly. Uh, but yeah. Yeah, for sure. All right. And, um, last, uh, last one for tonight, uh, your favorite TV show of all time. Favorite TV show of all time. Okay. Well, it would have to be wicked tuna. Wicked tuna. That's awesome. (laughs) (laughs) I, I, I wasn't even thinking thinking in that realm at all, but yeah, that's, uh, yeah, that's that's one of those that hooks you. Yeah, it's just uh, I don't know. They, there's it's probably over dramatic and all that, but I love I love the the watching them catch those big fish. So awesome! Yeah, I was expecting something like Frasier or The Office or Mash or something like that. <laughs> I, I wasn't even in that realm of thinking. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's actually it's it's I actually have the the girls. Uh, interested in it too which is amazing they will they'll sit and watch uh wicked two and with me awesome well we are gonna start wrapping things up um what's what's coming up for for dan flow and what's coming down the pipe what's next uh from a fishing standpoint um we've had a very slow winter so um don't know if it was red tide we had a lot of red tide which is an algae bloom down here that i think hurt the fishery so i'm going to be trying to get out as the water warms here uh, which is starting to now we're in the 70s now so um trying to get out and do more fishing get some customers out i've got i've got several customers who've had voiced uh, a desire to get out but I'm kind of holding them off because it's not been too good lately. So, so here in the next few weeks, I'll try to get some of my customers out and, and, uh, family and friends. So I'm looking forward to that. Awesome. And, um, I'll let you, uh, uh, shout out if you've got sponsors or, um, you know, supporters, anybody you want to say thank you to, um, I'll let you have the floor for that. Well, I, I don't have any sponsors, but I do have one supporter, and that's that's Julie. Um, without her, um, I wouldn't be sitting here. I, I believe she had a a hand, um, a very uh, tremendous hand in me surviving cancer. Um, God healed me, but Julie was an instrument uh, in God's healing. So, uh, and she was also the. Uh, the driving force behind so much of what uh, we have done from you know, launching the business to holding me accountable to write this book, write the story that, that God has given us in our life. Um, so thanks to Julie. Absolutely. And um, I'll let you, uh, you know, plug um, social media or um, a website. I'll go ahead and throw that up here. Um, all that good stuff. Um, and I'll let you say it so that, uh, people listening to the podcast can hear it as well. Awesome. So, yeah, so, uh, go out to, uh, uh, If you're interested to learn more about Fisherman's Apprentice and, 
Um, I, we have a lot more uh, uh, other uh, content out there as well um, related to that. So uh, um, I hope you get the opportunity to go out and uh, take a look. Absolutely. And I will encourage people to to sign up for the uh, the emails and um, you'll get a, a notification every time there's a new blog post. And I definitely encourage people to check out the blog. It's definitely uh, definitely something I look forward to. It's always very encouraging. So um, I definitely appreciate that. You have a, a YouTube channel that, that you're pulling these videos from. Um, I know uh, like you have some, you have some music and stuff that you, you put up mm-hmm. uh, in videos that you pull it from as a, uh, um, as a, as a, from YouTube or is there some more, is it just the website that you get those videos? I, I am on YouTube. Um, I think, uh, I think it's just, uh, you can just, uh, search for Dan Flowen on YouTube. I think it's the, the Dan Flowen, um, uh, YouTube channel. Um, and then there's also a Fisherman's Apprentice uh, Facebook page as well. So I post to really all those all those sites with similar content, if not the same, to try to uh, spread it out. Absolutely. Well, um, I will have all of that in the show notes. And Dan, thank you so much for coming on the show, um, uh, coming back on the show. I've really enjoyed it. And um, yeah, we. Me uh, too. I definitely think that we should uh, we should do it again. Absolutely. Thanks for having me again, Cam. I appreciate it. Absolutely. All right, and we are going to play an uh, an ad here to to take us out. All right. With thirty years of experience of handcrafting lures under his belt, Mister B of Mister B Lure Company is making high quality spinner baits, buzz baits, jigs, underspins, swim blades, and more right here in the U.S. All of his skirts are hand tied and all of his baits feature a baked on powder paint, all metal components and only owner and gamagatsu hooks. All of his baits come in a variety of colors and if you purchase a bait in the battle shad color, 30% of the proceeds go to the Wounded Warrior Project. To see the quality for yourself, go to MrBLureCompany.com, that's MRBLureCompany.com to place your order and use promo code faith the letter n fish the letter n p o d 1x10 at checkout to save 10% on your first order. Another huge thank you to Dan for coming back on the show and giving us the juice on grouper fishing and for talking us through your surrender to God. Um all of Dan's links will be in the show notes including a direct link to Fisherman's Apprentice, a link to the Contigo Thermos, and the All Things Faith and Fishing link that will have links to the website, all of our sponsors, um, how to think like a fish, and of course, the merch store where, in case you have forgotten, you can get 20% off of your order through the end of March with promo code FNF4K. That's going to do it for this episode. Y'all take care, and God bless. Thank you for listening to the Faith and Fishing Podcast. Faith and Fishing is produced and hosted by me, Cam Steele, and is sponsored by Jade's Jigs, Get Outdoors Pedal and Paddle, Save Your Outdoors, Atolas, and Mr. B Lure Company. Be sure to give us a rating and a review and to subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. That's going to do it for this episode. Y'all take care and God bless. <laughs>